Welcome to our review on the history of the atom. First, the good news for you. You don't need to know the names of these two Greek guys on the screen. What we do need to know is that the ancient Greeks were actually ones that had the first ideas about particles and atoms. So in amongst all of the toga wearing and beard stroking that they did, then they came up with the ideas about particles and atoms existing. From there, we actually jump forward to 1803, where we meet the first scientist we do need to know the name of, which is John Dalton. Now what Dalton actually did was he suggested that all matter is made from atoms and that all atoms of an element are identical to one another. So he then went on to say that those different elements will therefore contain different types of atom and they will have different masses to each other. But the key thing, the key idea to take away from this above all others is that he said that these atoms are tiny indestructible spheres. The second scientist we need to remember the name of is J.J. Thompson in 1897. And what he actually contributed was that he discovered the first subatomic particle, which was the electron. And what he actually did to discover that was he carried out cathode ray experiments. And what they showed was that the rays changed direction in electric and magnetic fields. So he then decided that this must mean that the cathode rays were actually tiny negatively charged particles. Once he discovered these tiny negatively charged particles, he then went on to suggest a new model for what the atom looked like, which was actually referred to as the plum pudding model, which you can see on the right. And what this suggested was that the atom was actually a sphere of positive charge, which is the big red cloud there, with the electrons dotted around inside. And it was called the plum pudding model because it looked like a plum pudding that he was eating at the time. Now, what this actually did with this plum pudding model is it made sense of two observations. Firstly, that the atoms contain electrons. And secondly, that the atoms are neutral overall because the positive cloud is cancelled out by the negative electrons scattered through it. The next scientist doesn't actually come around until 1909, and it's Ernest Rutherford. Again, we need to remember his name. What Rutherford did was he worked alongside two other scientists, which are Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, and they were putting the plum pudding model to test. So what they actually did was they had these very thin sheets of gold foil, and they fired these beams of positively charged alpha particles at them. And what they expected to see if the plum pudding model was correct was that those alpha particles would pass straight through. But what they actually found was that some of them changed direction and others actually bounced straight back at where they were fired from. And this diagram just shows us what they expected on the left and what they actually found on the right. So what we then find is that this doesn't support the plum pudding model idea. So that can't happen, which meant that Rutherford then had to come up with a new idea for the structure of the atom. And the diagram on the right shows you what his idea was. So Rutherford then explained the results by suggesting that in the center of the atom, we have a positively charged nucleus, and that nucleus contains most of the mass of the atom. One of the key things that it contains are positively charged protons. The second thing he suggested was that outside the nucleus, the electrons are actually orbiting around it like planets in a solar system. Our next scientist is Niels Bohr, who was doing his work in 1914. And what he actually worked out was that if the electrons were orbiting around that positive nucleus and the electrons are negatively charged, then those two opposite charges would attract and therefore the electrons would actually spiral inwards towards the nucleus. So he didn't think that sounded right. But what he also noticed was that when the atoms were heated, the light they gave out only had specific amounts of energy. And he said that this energy showed that electrons must orbit at a set distance from the nucleus in these fixed energy levels or shells. And that the energy that those electrons have when they're excited 
as they then fall back from that higher to lower energy level, that energy is going to be given out and it's given out as light that they could detect. So what he then did was he used a lot of mathematical modeling in order to develop his model using those different energy values. And what he came up with is the model we still use today with our nucleus in the center and then these fixed energy levels around the outside where the electrons are present. The final scientist we need to know about is James Chadwick, who carried out his work in 1932. So around his time, there was a lot of speculation that there were actually just these two types of subatomic particle in the nucleus, but we didn't know what this second one was. We knew the nucleus had these protons, but they thought there must be something else there and that those particles would have no charge, but they would have the same mass as a proton. And Chadwick was the one that actually discovered them through an experiment. So the key contribution that Chadwick made was that he discovered the neutron. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can now recall the names of those key scientists that were involved in developing the atom as we know it today, what they actually discovered, and in some cases, how they did it. If I haven't talked you through how they carried out their experiments, you don't need to know any more detail.